Uh, phones, please, uh, for attendance. Uh, Mahab the Jabbar, the DA, will take attendance at the end also. She took now, and she will take attendance at the end of the lecture. So with that, we would like to welcome uh, Mr. Nimit Ajman. Uh, thank you so much for, uh, for coming and for having him. Actually, like the one who referred to Mr. Munir is the Office of Research, the Startup Accelerator Program at Faisal University. And to Nofil Ammar, she is the one, she is one of the MBA graduates of Faisal University. And now she heads the program. It helps students if they have business ideas. Uh, the program helps students to start their business. And she asked me, answered, I don't know if it's here, she asked me to put this uh, accelerator. Uh, contact. So if you have a business idea, they will help you, okay, to start your business, connect you, and uh, they are the one who referred uh, Mr. Munir to uh, for the lecture series for your business. So this is the flyer I sent you, and um, you know, like you can tell, the uh, fintech. I actually when No told me we have Mr. Munir and fintech, right away I said yes, please let's go ahead and uh, you know like to have him. And uh, you can, from the flyer, from the email I sent you, Mr. Munir, uh, he has uh, uh, experience with startups in the fintech industry. And I think in the bio, you said you worked for Google also. And that's, you know, that's an attention for <laughs> students. You know, come and work for Google. And you know, that would be uh, one of the attention. Actually, I got an offer from Google when I was in Seattle, but then I declined it myself. But, uh, but uh, he is the heading sales at Lama Fintech Company, and he's going to talk to us about supply chain. And many thanks to Dr. Robert, Dr. Mario, Dr. Rami for being here. Uh, they are in the operation project management, and Dr. Mario he encourages the supply chain class to join. With that, you know, as we are uh, uh, running out of time, I would like to give a big welcome for Mr. Moni. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mahmoud, for the wonderful introduction. Um, good afternoon, everybody. I understand you have a holiday tomorrow, so I will try to keep you entertained um, so as you don't fall asleep. Uh, my name is Mini Bajmal. I've been working in fintech since before fintech was called fintech. Uh, the idea to me came at university, um, just like you guys. I was sitting in my lectures board uh, thinking, why do banks not have the capability of connecting younger people or middle-aged people uh, to services via technology. You still had to go to a bank to connect with things. You still had to fill in paper applications. And whereas on one, one hand, you had companies like SpaceX, Google, Facebook doing incredible things with internet and data, banks, on the other hand, still were stuck in their very archaic systems. Uh, so at that time, I didn't know what it was called, but uh, I learned over the time that it was morphing into an industry called fintech. Uh, and yes, Mahmoud, I have worked with Google. Uh, it's, it was an excellent uh, time uh, over there. This was during university. Um, the what some people find peculiar is my career path. It's been uh, dotted through multiple, I guess, industries or fields. Um, with Google, I was doing product marketing um, and we were building physical retail stores. Uh, testing out uh, the, I guess, traction with customers and consumers, teaching people that Google actually had hardware products. Uh, the, mo the most popular question I would get was, or point that was made was, I didn't know Google sold things um, because most Google services are free. Uh, but yes, they did start selling phones, laptops, uh, smart home devices at the time. Um, and as soon as I graduated university, I took, I left the Google job. Um, and I moved to London, which was at the time uh, a hub for multiple things. And I still wasn't too sure where to go for my career. Um, but fintech always had this appeal to me because of its capability and, um, and possibility to actually serve a much, much larger audience. Um, uh, and that audience is often called the underserved or unbanked people. And this, believe it or not, was still an issue in countries like Canada, US, um, UK, back in 2017, 2018. Um, when I moved to the UK, I started working with the British Parliament, actually building or helping build the framework 
uh, that allowed large fintech companies to actually operate within the system's policies uh, legally and with security. Because one of the biggest issues uh, in fintech or finance is trust. You know, you're handling money for people, consumers, businesses, entities, charities. So trust was a key driver to push the fintech movement forward because without it, nobody would actually put their money into a, a digital phone account. And I myself was a, I guess, uh, hesitant adopter. Um, I wouldn't call myself an early adapter uh, of technology, which a lot of people in the US, especially in San Francisco, they're, they're very early adapters of technology. They like taking that risk. But your average consumer, which is roughly 95% of the population in any country, is not okay with taking that risk. So I remember when I moved to Canada, uh, to the UK, I needed to transfer about $5,000 and I couldn't take it cash. So at the time there was a company called TransferWise and I was like, okay, so I put my money into this application and when I go to UK, it will be there. How do I know it will be there? Uh, so that led me down a little rabbit hole. Um, uh, and then I realized that the UK's framework that was still getting built up at the time called open banking was putting in safeguards to protect consumers um, and to protect corporates by providing insurance, providing sandboxing, which the uh, Saudi Arabia now is doing with technology as well, uh, so that they can build up a framework that protects the consumers. So that framework is officially called open banking. Um, so through the lecture, uh, what I'll do is walk you guys through what fintech is, then explain a little bit about what uh, open banking is, and then talk about Lama, the company I work for at the moment. Um, and at, towards the end, I'll take some questions from you guys. And I do expect some questions. I don't want to stand here quietly looking at your faces. Um, they're wonderful, but yeah. Um, so yeah, let's uh, get started. Okay, so what is fintech? Um, so unlike a lot of other technologies uh, like AI, uh, machine learning, uh, the metaverse, so Facebook just changed its name to meta. Uh, so unlike all of those things, fintech is not actually a technology in itself. The wonderful thing about fintech is that it brings together different components of technology to enable a digital experience for finance itself. Um, and the amazing part about it is that you can bring in technology from any sector, from any industry to enable a simple process. It can be a bank transfer. It can be a complex financing setup between a bank for a multi-billion dollar company. It can be a simple transfer between two people in a different country. Um, it can be, uh, you know, your payment on uh, apps like, uh, I'm still getting used to your apps over here. Uh, Talabat, um, Food Panda, uh, there's also Kareem, uh, ja Jawi, uh, Jazz, Jazz, yeah. So all of those, so the other day I was, I downloaded Jazz um, and it wouldn't accept my card. And to, another, to a normal person that would have been like, okay, it's, there's some issue with the app. But I know why that issue was there because when I put in my card information, because I have a Canadian card, the authentication takes about one second. They charge you one rail to see if your bank is actually active. So the gap was between, the issue wasn't with the app, the issue was with the connection between those two applications, one being the bank, one being the application, and in between somewhere, there's an API um, that serves as a connecting connection between them two. That is the beauty of FinTech. So a lot of your apps these days they wouldn't be possible without that payment infrastructure, which has traditionally been very slow. Um, and to think, if you just take a moment and realize that when you order some food on a platform and you put in your card details or you're using STC Pay, in a split second, your banking information, who you are, what you do, is being taken from the card, being sent through the data universe to an application in a bank, they confirm that you have the money in your account, they transfer that money to the corporate, the application, and then you get your food, all within milliseconds. That is the beauty of FinTech, and that is the enablement that we're able to do. Um, and a big misconception with FinTech is that it's very consumer facing. Um, I myself was, uh, fell to that misconception, and mostly because my work initially, 
when I was working with the government in the UK, involved working with consumer facing fintechs. So they would be banks, they would be service providers, they would be new banks, there would be loan companies, uh, there would be student loan financing companies, uh, and so on. But there's a huge background of what fintech can do that isn't actually visible to uh, your average person on a daily basis. And that's where we come into supply chain, um, which is the class you've been attending. Um, so what Lama does is basically leverages different pieces of technology to enable financing in supply chain industry. Um, most critically, we focus on SMEs. SMEs are small and medium enterprises. And traditionally, because of the lack of data, accessing funding for those SMEs has been incredibly difficult. So what you're seeing is not only the enablement of students like yourselves to order pizza at 2 a.m. while you're studying for your exam the next day, but you're also taking that same concept, multiplying it by like 50x, 150x, and implementing it for larger corporations or SMEs in this case. Because once you have the data and access to that information line in between the APIs, the magic that happens is that now you can tell within a split second that, okay, this SME that's traditionally done business on paper, pen, they have a big log book of accounting. Um, now their transactions are digitized. Once they're digitized, you can actually understand how good or how strong the business's health is. When you have the business's health, you can now help them get financing. Um, and that's what we'll go towards. So FinTech, again, going back to what FinTech is, FinTech isn't one technology. It isn't one line of code or a set of codes. It's bringing together multiple different pieces of technology from around the world, putting them together to enable those small processes between businesses, consumers, companies, and banks to enable them to digitally access funding. Um, one of my, uh, I, was, I was sitting with a, a client yesterday, uh, Marsul. I'm sure you guys have used Marsul. Uh, and I was sitting with the CFO and he was telling me that back before 2014, uh, when he was working for a different company, because of the lack of data, because of the lack of connectivity, banks would not open accounts for his employees. He had to go to the CEO of the company, the bank, and request a whole group of bank accounts. And then he got a stack of cards that he went to his office and gave to his employees. And he said, listen, I will not pay you cash anymore. I will pay you in this account and you can go use this card to withdraw the money. It made his work a lot easier because now he doesn't have to carry around hundreds of thousands of rails of cash and fill in the paperwork, fill in the due diligence, where the cash is going, the KYC. Uh, KYC is know your consumer or know your customer. It's required for legal purposes, uh, for anti-money laundering and so on. So he saved hours of his work by speaking to a bank and getting a bank account for his customers. And it was a great example of how far the digitization has brought uh, economies like Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, India, Bangladesh. Um, so the, the effect of it is not very well very, very visible in like countries like Canada and the UK because they've already been using technology. Uh, but in countries like Saudi Arabia a few years ago or Pakistan, India, countries in Africa, they're going from a cash economy directly into a digital economy. Whereas we've had the opportunity to go slowly from a cash to debit cards. Now you can tap. Uh, now you have credit cards. Now you have a credit card on your phone. I've had the pleasure of going through all of those phases, whereas consumers now in developing countries can leverage that same technology to go from cash or some, in some cases bartering to straight into a digital economy. And some of the biggest fintechs at the moment are coming out of uh, Southern Africa, Middle, Middle Africa, uh, North Africa. Cairo is a huge hub. And if you look at the little bubbles, in 2016, fintech had 17.48 billion in funding globally. By 2018, it was 147 billion. Um, I wouldn't round that up. Uh, I'm a mathematician, so I'm very keen on numbers. Uh, but in Q2, so up until about July uh, 2021, so just in the first six months of 2021, that funding has broken all records globally by 90, $98 billion globally for fintechs. That's in Singapore, UK, Canada, US, every country in the world. $98 billion 
just in the first half of the year. So if you go by that standard, that's about roughly 100 billion. By the end of 2021, you're expecting over $200 billion worth of funding in fintech. So it's a very fast growing, very fast paced uh, industry. And uh, you'll read in the news that, you know, everything is fintech now, everything is fintech. The beauty of fintech is that, the beauty of our society is that, um, or some would call it an issue, is that everything is worth something. So whenever you're requesting something, whenever you're doing something, there is a transaction happening. And that transaction nowadays is a monetary value. So technically, yes, every, not every startup or company is a fintech. Um, or, well, the other way around, actually, every startup or company is a fintech, but not every fintech is a startup company, technically. Um, or I'm mixing them up. My apologies. I'm going to move forward. Uh, what is open banking? So what enables fintech is open banking. And this is the fr policy framework that I worked on in the UK. Now it's being implemented in Saudi Arabia. There's a whole guide from Sama that you can actually download. It's only six pages. It's a great read if you're interested in it. Um, open banking basically allows traditional corporates or banks to give access to smaller companies, okay? So a company like Lendo or Lama um, will take, they will only work on one side of the business. So we do supply chain finance. So we don't, we don't have bank accounts, we, don't, we just need information for the supply chain finance bit. So we reach out to banks via APIs, connect with them and do that transaction, knowing that the customer XYZ has a bank account, has information, the company knows who they are and so on. So open banking, literally, it just says what it is. It opens up banks' data to other smaller corporates or startups, and that allows for more competition. And a good example of that is when I was working with uh, the policy advisors at Westminster Parliament, we would bring in the latest and greatest fintech startups on one side. On the other side, we would bring in uh, old banks like Barclays, JP Morgan, uh, HSBC, and we would say, okay, here's the fintech or the open banking framework. What is your feedback? So I remember uh, sitting with the CEO of a company called iWaka. They basically give funding to small businesses. And the CEO said, listen, I was sitting there looking for business for uh, looking for financing for my small business. I went to XYZ uh, Bank and they said, sorry, we do not offer funding that small. A um, couple of hundred thousand dollars and so on. Uh, so that was a problem for him. So, but that's a missed opportunity for the large bank. They didn't have the capacity or the technology to digitally process that information. But what he did was he went, he made a bank, he made a company called iWaka. He set a standard of what's required from small businesses. So like a small convenience store where you can get uh, some milk, food, whatever. Uh, if he needs a 20, 40, 50, $100,000 loan, he can call iWaka, say, hey, this is what I make every year. This is what I have. This is my bank. Can you please give me a loan? And within five, 10 minutes, they will get a loan. Whereas at the bank, you go and they're doing paperwork and credit check and days to return you and maybe the bank uh, salesperson will call you back if your business is worth it to him. Because think about it, if the salesperson is sitting there working with billion dollar companies and then a small corporate or a small business comes and says, I need $50,000, do you think he's gonna care about the $50 million deal or the $50,000 deal? So that's where the market gap was. So iWaka is a multi-billion dollar company now simply by serving the underserved, which was the small businesses that needed funding. And they had a really good uh, default rate. Uh, so they barely had any businesses defaulting on them, making sure that their investments were secure. Uh, so that's, that's the beauty of open banking. Now you can take that and implement it between corporates, businesses around the world to build that trust, build that framework and grow business. Because now that small business has that extra fifty, hundred thousand dollars of funding, he can get new products. He can bring in more varieties of dishwashing soap. He can bring in new, new crisps or import something that some of his consumers want and so on. Doing more business, which means it's better for the economy because more people are spending money at his business. He's creating more jobs. So it, it's a cycle that fuels itself. Um, and overall, it's a win-win-win situation. So yeah, and open banking is being very quickly adapted by a bunch of countries across the world, uh, Saudi Arabia being one of them, uh, which is why I'm here, uh, because the, uh, and the, the, ways it, the ways it's happening is there's private, there's publicly supported, um, and then there's uh, 
public driven. So the UK, the government built the open banking platform. In Canada, uh, it's a market driven platform. And in Saudi Arabia, it's government and market driven. So there are uh, av there is availability for uh, a private company to build open banking infrastructure and the Saudi government will support it. So it's a bit of a hybrid um, and it's still developing. Um, Canada still doesn't have open banking, shockingly. Uh, and it's growing because the need for it is growing. People in Canada, Canada has a very strangely slow banking system. Um, even now, when I go back, I'm shocked by it. Uh, but it's okay. It's, it's changing slowly. And that's typical. We're very risk averse in Canada. And we're very nice about things. So we don't really tell the government to do things very quickly. We just wait for them to happen. They eventually happen. Sorry? It's cold. It is very cold. I think that slows us down. <laughs> Um, so yeah, so coming to Lama, uh, one of the biggest gaps in the market, just like that small business I mentioned to you, now we're growing, going to a slightly bigger level where a small business, you know, let's say Muneeb Ajmal's pipe company, um, all I do is make pipes and sell them to Aramco, Sabic, um, or the Ministry of Finance or Ministry, whatever, okay, I'm, I make, let's say, X amount of pipes a year because that's all I can afford to make. Um, but if I want to grow, right, I'll go to a bank for a loan because I need to invest in the company. I need to hire more people. I need to uh, grow the factory, uh, buy more materials. Where do I get that cash? Because my business is so small, I have 25, 30 staff, a couple of salespeople, and maybe five, 10 contracts worth a couple of million dollars. What happens is that that business might not be digitized or most likely it's not, especially in Saudi Arabia, even in Canada. Uh, those businesses are often very paper, uh, manual processes, uh, and they like to keep it in the family almost, and that's applicable to pretty much any industry. It's, it's a very tightly run operation. Um, so they're not always very uh, open to sharing their information with uh, credit agencies or uh, tax authorities and stuff. So there's no data for, to judge how good their business is doing. So when they go to a bank, asking for a million dollar loan. Um, so let's say Muneeb's pipeline company gets an offer to build uh, 3X pipes for Saudi Aramco. So Saudi Aramco says, Muneeb, can you build us 300 pipes? My capacity is only 100 pipes. How do I do that? I want the contract, I can do it, but I don't have the capacity to do it. So what I do is we go to a bank and the bank says, sorry, we don't want to give you this much money because we don't know how good your business is. We don't know uh, if you'll be able to pay us back. Um, if you give us the guarantee of something, we might be able to do something. So he puts his company or his house as leverage. Um, leverage is as a security, um, as a security deposit in a sense that he will pay that money back. So that gap is uh, huge in the industry, not just in Saudi Arabia, but globally. And the funny thing is that those small companies, SMEs, contribute over 50% to uh, your, your country's GDP, depending on where you are. In Canada, it's about 50. I think UK is like 52. Um, some countries like 48%. And they're a huge place for jobs. Um, young people, new people, uh, people with, without much experience go to these places to get jobs because it's easier, you're more hands-on experience. So on one hand, they're building or contributing 50, 60% to your global economy or your national economy. And on the other hand, they're not able to get funding. What's the issue? And the issue is or data. We don't have data or they don't have a big enough ticket price for a big bank to fund them. Um, and Saudi Arabia has set a vision in Vision 2030. One of the pillars is to grow their SME industry. Um, and in the next uh, 10, 15 years, there's a huge influx of you guys. Um, there, I think the youth population under 30 is somewhere above 60% in Saudi Arabia. So in the next two, three, four, five years, by 2030, there are going to be hundreds of thousands of young minds, brilliant minds like you, going to get jobs. Where are you going to work? You won't have a job if these companies are not doing more business and they can't do more business if they don't have funding. So the growth of SME, uh, SME contribution to GDP of KSA is one of the biggest pillars for Saudi Vision 2030. And again, typ just typically because it's an SME, it's not often spoken about. You see Neom, you see, uh, you know, Riyadh. Uh, uh, Riyadh seasons and other very attractive things because to consumers, to your everyday person, 
it's a very visible thing, whereas SME contribution, nobody really thinks about it. Um, so what Lama does is we found the problem, so the gap between payables and receivables, and how the model works is basically, I, Manib company, pipeline company, makes 100 pipes, I give them to Aramco, Aramco says, Manib, we will pay you in 90 days. Okay, it's a very standard operating model. Uh, me, as a small company, I can't really say much to Aramco. I have to accept the term. So whatever I can negotiate, I can maybe negotiate 60 days instead of 90, but that's about it. They won't always pay you right away. And this is the case for most corporates, most, most large industries. They pay you based on how they get paid. But for a large company like Aramco, Sabic, uh, Ministry of Finance, they're not worried about paying their employees. But I have to wait 60 days, 90 days, sometimes 100, 20 or up to 180 days. Um, I met a client who had a one year payment term. So he wouldn't pay the company for a year. Uh, so imagine in between if I need to hire someone to build 300 pipes instead of 100, where do I get the financing? The bank is not gonna do it, okay? They'll offer me very high terms, very high fees, um, and maybe take two to three months. So what Lama does is, um, for, well, uh, before I go there, so with, for the financial institutions, th for them to go look for these small loans, it's very time consuming. They have to put in the same amount of effort for a $50,000 loan or a $50 million loan. The same amount of due diligence, the same amount of research, the same amount of people have to work on it, almost. Um, so it's not worth it for them to shift that energy towards a really small uh, loan that's not going to regenerate as much of a return. But there's a beauty, it's still a return. So what Lama does is it takes that supply chain concept, okay, that 90 day principle, let's standardize it at 90 days. So Aramco says, Muni, we'll pay you on 90 days. Um, I have to wait until then. So Lama comes in between, um, it's, it integrates with Aramco's computers and invoicing platform, and it brings on board the SME. Um, where by bringing, by giving them a platform where they can submit all of their invoices, we're instantly digitizing them. So for a perspective, a loan would take him or her running the business a couple of days, maybe a couple of months to get the paperwork and processing done. But Lama, you can sign up in five minutes onto our platform if there's a corporate of yours that's on Lama's platform. So if Saudi Aramco is on Lama. Any of Saudi Aramco's suppliers, whether it's a $50 million company or a $150 million company, they can come to Lama and in five, 10 minutes, sign up to the platform. What happens after that is we, so here's, a, I'll actually I'll show you this one. So the supplier, so Manib's pipeline company, sends the invoice for $100,000 to Aramco. Aramco will review this invoice and say, okay, we have received the pipes and we approve this payment. Um, there you go, it approves the payment. They review it, they say, okay, the pipes are good and we will pay Manib in 90 days. So that contract is signed and it's all digitized now. So now we know that this transaction, it exists before we had to get the paperwork. So what happens after that, that invoice goes to Lama. Um, now Lama sits in between the companies. Uh, so it, typically what would happen here is that once it's approved, Manib's pipeline company would have to wait 90 days to get paid. Uh, but now what we can do is we flip the process, okay? We can help suppliers, so Manib's pipeline company, get paid early, okay? So instead of financing from a bank, which is going to cost them, you know, 10%, 15% or very high rate because of their credit rating, what Lama does is Lama flips the model and leverages the large corporates financial standing. We say, okay, Aramco bought these goods from Munib. Aramco is a very stable company. We know how much business they do. They posted the highest, uh, I think, uh, profit in a quarter, a record profit, I think $32 billion in a quarter uh, in the world. This just announced it like four days ago, more than Microsoft, more than Apple, um, and the highest dividend uh, accordingly. So we know from public information and from their credit rating from SEMA, which is a, a government approved credit rating agency, that they are a very sound financial company. So we take the invoice from Aramco and we list it onto Lama's platform. Aramco says, if the, pro if the supplier wants an early payment, let us know. 
Um, so what happens is, tomorrow Sabit comes to me and says, Mini, we need 300 pipes, okay? And I'm thinking, okay, I need 25 more people. I need 500 tons of steel to build those pipes. Um, how do I do that? Where do I get the money from? Uh, I, you know, Aramco owes me, so maybe I'll go to the bank. So typically what happens in supply chain finance is Manib's company would take that invoice, go to a bank and say, listen, Aramco owes me X amount of money in 90 days. If you give me this money now, when Aramco pays me, I will pay you for X amount uh, as a profit. And the bank will do its process and maybe give him the funding. But they would have to give that as security. So they have to submit a promissory note that they will pay them back or a letter of credit. So it's added inconvenience for the, for the small SME. So he might need that money in the next week, but the bank's process might take a couple of days or a couple of weeks. So what happens is um, that invoice uh, is now on Lama's uh, platform. So Muneeb goes on to Lama's mobile application or desktop from his office and looks and sees that, okay, Aramco approved my payment for early payment um, if I want it. So let's say that invoice was worth $100,000. What I do is, and that's the money I need to expand and fulfill the contract for Sabic. What I do is I take the money, I go onto Lama's platform and I bid for it. Okay, we have AI and ML algorithms that take into account market prices, its criticality uh, to the corporate or their buyer. For example, steel pipes are very important to a, a company like Aramco because all of the oil, all of the chemicals are being processed through those pipes. So we take the information of how important that is to Saudi Aramco. We find the information of how much steel is worth or what market forces are there. Maybe there's a, a very low um, interest rates and everybody is looking for financing or very high interest rates and financing isn't really readily available. So we take all of that information into account and within a split second, make a decision and give them a number. So Muneeb's uh, you know, it'll. Uh, I submit that I want one hundred thousand dollars. The algorithm will say, "Okay, your Aramco invoice is available for early payment. Uh, would you like to take a discount?" Okay, so that discount is now the supplier's cost for financing. It might be 0.5 percent. It might be one percent, two percent, ten percent. For ease of numbers, let's say it's ten percent. So it says, "Hey, Manib, if you want ninety thousand dollars today." please give Aramco a 10% discount. And I say, okay, I do some mental calculation. On Aramco's contract, I lose $10,000, but if I take that 90,000, I can make 300 more pipes, making me roughly $40,000. 40 minus 10, $30,000 profit. Okay, it's a very simple mathematical equation. So in my mind, I'm like, okay, 10% is a discount I can afford. And the wonderful thing about Lama is that we don't have to wait to check their credit. We don't have to wait for paperwork from the small company. As soon as he submits that information, that invoice goes to Aramco. Now, we'll divide it to Aramco. So if you go, Aramco comes in. Aramco can review this or automate it. It's up to them. Aramco, let's say, you know, Abdulaziz is sitting at Aramco and he's like, oh, okay, Manib's company has submitted this invoice for a discount at 10%. Yes, I have the cash to pay him early and make 10%. Because think about it, Aramco owed Manib $100,000. If Aramco pays Manib uh, in 10 days early or 50 days early, they will save $10,000. That's good business for them. So it's, it's an incentive for Aramco to pay him early because he's making some money or saving some money. And that money directly impacts their financials. So the $30 billion they just made, it would be $30 billion plus $10,000 extra cash profit for doing absolutely nothing, just giving some cash to a small business early. And what they're doing in the process is they're not just paying someone early for a small profit, they're securing the business, okay? They're securing a partner of theirs because I've been working with Aramco for a very long time and now my business is secure, I can pay my employees, I can grow my business, and in the future, I can give Aramco more pipes as well. So they're doing multiple things at the same time. And it's a win-win-win situation where Muneeb's company gets money to make some extra profit, Aramco saves some money, and they can make extra profit. Now, this, the beauty of this is that when Saudi Aramco approves the invoice for early payment, we have a second part. 
Let's say it, the company that's the buyer is in Saudi Aramco. It's a smaller company that doesn't necessarily have the cash. What they can do is because they've approved the invoice, the payment to the supplier has to be made. We've made that as a guarantee to the supplier that if they request a discount, we will pay them no matter what. So if Aramco can't pay it or the other company can't pay, it doesn't have the cash, what it does is it automatically sends it to Lama's marketplace. Now Lama's marketplace is not like Amazon. It's not like uh, Etsy. We are building a marketplace for financing. So if I go back to the initial conversation about you know, the bank giving financing, for them, the cost for financing for a $50 million loan um, is the same um, for, uh, as for the $50,000 loan. So what it's not worth it for them to bring that in. So what Lama's Marketplace does is it aggregates, it brings together hundreds of invoices, 50,000, 150,000, 10 million, 5 million, brings all of them together. So now suddenly on, for the bank, there's $10 million worth of loans, okay, for a very secure investment into Aramco. So we leverage, by leverage, I mean we look at Aramco's credit and we give out a loan paying the supplier, he walks away, he does his business, and Aramco pays the marketplace back in 10, uh, 15, 60, 120 days, whatever the agreed upon payment term is. And there can either be a very, it's very low risk for the banks because they're not risking uh, their investment on a small company, but they're actually betting on Aramco, which is a large corporate, and they can trust that investment. And because banks invest people's money, it's important for them to invest into something they can trust. And uh, that's basically how Lama works. That's Lama's team. We have Sumit, who is from uh, London. Uh, he's an ex-banker. All of them are ex-bankers except me. Uh, I've worked mostly in fintech, um, so I, and I'm also was the youngest on the team. Now we have Abdulaziz. Uh, so it's been it's been a very exciting time. I've been in Saudi Arabia for about a year now, working with multiple corporates, um, trying to. Can you still hear me? trying to understand what their needs are. And every single time I meet a new corporate, they tell me about different challenges. Sometimes the SME says, I already do this discount, but I still don't get paid. How do I get my money? So we found a way to guarantee that they get money because now once it's approved, they will get paid. So we provide that uh, promise, I guess, that says, hey, use us. All you have to do is pay this and that's it. We won't waste your time. Um, and I forgot to mention one thing. Once the payment is approved by either Aramco or Lama's Marketplace, we pay suppliers within 24 to 72 hours. Imagine what you can do with that money within 24 to 72 hours instead of waiting for weeks. Um, so that's how Lama leverages different technology like uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, APIs, uh, cloud-based technology um, built together to help SMEs grow. Now imagine if there's, I think, 900 and something thousand SMEs in Saudi Arabia. Even if 50% are able to grow by 10%, the number is incredible of how much they can contribute. And for Saudi Vision 2030, the goal is very conservative. It's 35% from 22%, I believe. So currently, uh, back in 2016, uh, SMEs contributed 20 something percent to Saudi Arabia's GDP compared to 50, 60% globally. Um, and your goal for 2030 is uh, roughly 35%. Um, and I'm confident with a solution like Lama, where small companies can access that funding very quickly, they can grow quicker. And when they grow, they will be creating jobs for students like you um, or bringing in new workforce and new business and maybe even invest in innovation and technology for their own corporates. Uh, that's about it for me and Lama. Um, I will take any questions if you guys have any. I don't wanna hold you guys up too long. Oh, one other thing I'd like to add. Uh, so last week was the Saudi Green Initiative and they announced that uh, you guys will be reaching net carbon neutrality by 2060, I believe. Um, and the wonderful thing about FinTech is that uh, I also work in sustainable finance uh, with the World Economic Forum uh, Global Shapers. And sustainable finance, if you know about COP26, it's a conference happening in uh, Glasgow right now. And globally, countries are setting goals and targets to reach net carbon neutrality. And it's a very critical issue. The, with data, you can actually monitor what businesses are doing, where that financing is going. Because once before, without digitization, when the loan was released, we didn't know what the business was doing with it. 
Now we do. We understand what the, is being done with that money. Um, and with uh, decentralized finance like crypto and stuff, all of these things get integrated into, crypt, uh, into fintech. We have visibility of how that money is being spent. So to achieve Saudi Arabia's uh, net, neutral, net carbon neutrality by 2060, companies like Aramco can actually say, okay, Muneeb's pipe company, we will pay you at a smaller discount. So you requested 10%, we'll give you maybe seven. Okay, so you save some more money. Uh, but you can only spend it on uh, steel or welding methodologies that have a less a smaller carbon footprint. So you actually push another avenue of growth, another avenue of climate action right through fintech itself. So that's another wonderful thing that you can do with data when you know, when you know what's actually going on. Yeah, that's it. Thank you guys for coming. <laughs> um, my email is right there, muneeb at lama.sa. Feel free to reach out um, if you're looking to, you know, uh, get some experience in the fintech company. Um, we're happy to interview you. Yes, take a picture. <laughs> how, how do you build against the fraud? There were cases of fraud because of mm -hmm. the past. Uh, like, for example, they, they cook the paper more. Mm -hmm. So when the fintech go and check, oh, they are great. Mm -hmm. Showing them with money. Yeah. But the, 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 the fund there was mm -hmm. bad. Mm -hmm. And uh, any kind of artist, they now build a yeah. portfolio. Yeah. And what do we do there? So, in the case of a SME, we don't care. Okay. If they're the supplier looking for funding, we don't care what their like actual financial standing is because we're not leveraging their credit. We're leveraging the large corporate's credit. So, we're indifferent about you know, whether or not they have cooked their books or gotten a portfolio that's not real. Because if they have an invoice that they sent to a company that is legitimate, okay, that side we do more due diligence. So one thing is we, we're doing is we're hoping or we're working with SEMA, which is your Saudi uh, credit agency. Um, they're very strict on how they operate. Uh, so they have a very good credit profile for large corporations across Saudi Arabia we're integrating their technology with our platform via an API. So as soon as a company like uh, Aramco or Sabic makes an account with Lama, we do an instant credit check. So that's the first line of defense. The second line of defense is when businesses are sending invoices via Lama, so from Aramco it's going to Muneeb's pipeline company or Ahmed's uh, utility company, whatever, we can build a credit profile for ourselves. So we know how much business the corporate is doing, how much money they're owed, how over leveraged they are from SEMA. We can take all of that information into account and build our own credit risk profile and judge based on that. And then those, uh, we're trying to kind of finesse it out. Uh, for example, I think SEMA doesn't review business licenses or expiration dates. So we're putting in a system to make sure that business licenses are checked every couple of months to make sure that some company that we onboarded is still a valid company that doesn't have bad debt. So those are some of the uh, checks and balances that we have. Yeah. Any other questions? You're welcome. Any other questions? It was very exciting to meet you guys. I hope I didn't put any of you to sleep. No? Okay. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Very good idea. Thank you.